Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Jeanette Jackson, CEO of Foresight. We are very excited about the conversation that we are going to have today. Um, this is one of many webinars that we have been hosting since the pandemic hit. And obviously everyone has been working really hard to go virtual and find um, the right topics and engaging pieces that we can all share to bring everyone together as we all continue to strive to help uh, Canada transition to a green economy, help clean tech SMEs scale up, and of course all the other fundamental ecosystem development efforts that go into making that work. Uh, the agenda today, a few welcome notes as usual, and then we're going to jump right into it uh, with our special guests to talk about the UN sustainability, UN sustainability Development Goals as well as introduce, I forgot to add a line item here, some really great information on B Corps and the new BMCI, so the new Foresight Business Model Canvas Plus Impact, and then we'll have an open discussion. In terms of welcome notes, everything's being recorded. It will be shared with you afterwards. Um, I don't know if you see, but if you've been following along Foresight events before COVID hit, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals have become a very core pillar to all of our activities. It's a great way for alignment and ensuring that we're in touch with what's happening globally when it comes to sustainability, not only with clean technologies, but all the elements that the SDGs address. And then of course, if you have been part of our uh, launch program, you know that the Business Model Canvas has been a foundational tool for many years, and we're really excited about the updates that we're uh, providing uh, to that today. Uh, if you also get our newsletters, we had a press release out today. We have formally launched a pan-Canadian COVID-19 support program for clean tech SMEs. So please visit foresightcac.com if you'd like to take a look. And without, there we go, some information there. Um, so without further ado, let's dive in. Our conversation today is about resilience and transformational change, how the SDGs and innovations in business models support resiliency. And our panel consists of Lynn Wagner from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And Lynn, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself more formally during your presentation. We also have Frank LaFleur, who is with Crush Marketing, but also an EIR here with Foresight, who's been supporting a lot of the work on the BMC. Stephen Wilson, who is our operations, uh, Director of Operations. And uh, he's also obviously been working with all the launch companies to uh, work through all programming, connect you with EIRs, and so really important to have him part of the discussion today. And of course, Julie uh, Angus from Open Ocean Robotics, who is going to dive in and talk about how impact has been a key success factor for some of her work in raising money and, and, and scaling up her business. And finally, Christy O'Leary from Decade Impact, who is our expert on B Corps today. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Lynn. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm Lynn Wagner with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. We're headquartered in Winnipeg, Canada with offices in Ottawa and Toronto, Geneva, and a few other um, uh, people, um, associates who, um, work for us from a number of places around the world. Um, is, it was part of my work with the um, International Institute for Sustainable Development. I follow the negotiation processes at the UN and had the privilege of watching the SDGs uh, get negotiated and developed. Um, and so I'm really pleased to be here to, to share that story with you and to, to discuss uh, what the SDGs are. Um, the, the SDGs followed the, the Millennium Development Goals, so I'll talk about uh, the differences between the two. I'm really focusing um, today on the, the interlinkages and how the SDGs are uh, an integrated framework and not just a, a checklist of common goals. Uh, and then I'll close with a few uh, resources for finding additional information. Uh, so the next slide, please. Uh, so I want to start with this statement that the Rotterdam School of Management came out with last year. I think it's really powerful that this uh, School of Management came up with this mission statement um, saying that they had adopted the SDGs 
as a reference framework. Um, and so that point again, that they're this framework, they aren't just a, a checklist of common goals. Um, the SDGs were agreed by world leaders in 2015, the follow, uh, the end of a um, negotiation process. They set out a framework to classify the most urgent social, economic, and environmental challenges facing the world. So those are the three pillars of sustainable development, social, economic, and environmental challenges. Uh, and they're seen as really interlinked, um, that you can't just uh, pursue one, one of those uh, pillars without um, needing to address the others to really achieve your goals. Um, the SDGs are neutral, non-political, provide an internationally recognized point of reference to ensure that what we do is relevant, meaningful, and has real societal impact. Um, so each of the SDGs uh, doesn't offer any, you know, new bullet points. So, um, you know, thing uh, that we hadn't thought of doing before. The thing about the SDGs that's really unique is this idea that they are to be universally implemented uh, as an integrated framework. Um, and so thinking about the positive reinforcing um, elements uh, between the SDGs and also the, the negative um, impacts where if you're pursuing one, you might be having an impact on the other keeping um, all of these global challenges in mind at the same time. Um, so the next slide. Uh, so the, the Millennium Development Goals uh, were the, the global um, goal set for this 15 year period between 20 or 2000 and 2015. They hadn't been negotiated. And so the first five years, they really didn't catch on as um, this, um, this goal set that donors, um, countries, um, uh, CSOs, businesses would um, all pay attention to. It was really only at the five-year point that there was a, a global um, agreement decision that, that these goals should really be um, a focus, a, a global focus for activities. Um, so they, they lost five years really because of that. So when the SDGs were developed, they, they didn't wanna lose those five years. They wanted them to be um, negotiated um, and for you know, people around the world, countries around the world to really see themselves and their priorities in that global goal set. Um, and so that um, made the negotiations maybe a little more difficult, but as a result, in, when they were adopted, it, it was a universal embrace of the SDGs. Um, also, the MDGs were not supposed to be universally implemented. They were seen as something that the developed countries would help developing countries implement. Um, so the developed countries would be providing, you know, the funding, but they, it wasn't something that they were trying to achieve themselves. Um, and again, they weren't seen as this integrated set of objectives. They were really more of a checklist. Um, and so there were some cases where uh, maybe a well was dug, but it didn't take into a fat, uh, consideration. Um, maybe the, the safety of the women who are using the well or the, the environmental impacts um, that were affecting the water at that point. Um, so so the, the, the SDGs really learned from the MDGs. And the, uh, you know, on the positive side, there, at the end of the MDG um, period, there was recognition that this goal-based agenda had um, a lot of power to have all you know, foundations, um, governments, um, the um, private sector in certain areas focused on the same objectives uh, was able to achieve some development progress. Um, so when it came time to think about what would um, uh, take the place of the MDGs, the um, Glow, uh, through, through a number of decisions, um, the decision was that it would be these sustainable development goals. Uh, so next slide. Um, so this is how you've probably seen this picture of the, the kind of SDG tiles aligned like this. Uh, there's 17 goals. Each goal has a number of targets making comprising 169 targets. Um, each 
target is going to be measured through a series of indicators. Um, so right now there are 231 indicators. And the way it's set up then, you know, the, the idea is that you can measure uh, using the indicator, see if there's progress on one goal, see if progress on one goal is actually affecting uh, the progress on another goal. Um, there are any number of different ways that um, these interlinkages could be evaluated, considered, uh, used to, to, um, to drive forward um, progress on all of these um, objectives at once. Um, so if you can click to the next. Um, and so I wanted to show you this depiction of the SDGs so that you don't always have that um, slide set or the, the tiles just one next to the other, which is really kind of a checklist that these SDGs have interactions with each other. This is one, um, uh, some researchers way of putting it together that you have the biosphere at the bottom, the base, and it is supporting society, the, the no poverty, the zero hunger, the education, the gender equality, um, and those pieces, the, the health, those pieces have to be in place if you're going to have a strong economy, you're going to have innovation and infrastructure built, being built, you're going to have um, eliminate um, or work to eliminate inequalities. Um, and then at the top is the, the partnership uh, for the SDGs. Um, but so the, the idea really is that it's this interlinked um, uh, um, agenda. Um, and the, the, the number 17 is not um, seen as some magical number. There were 13 negotiation sessions leading to the development of these 17 goals and 169 targets. Um, the first eight, or so each meeting was about a week at a time um, and they were held about a month apart from each other. And so the uh, delegates, the experts would come to the UN in New York and each of the first eight sessions focused on um, really exploring as a group what the global challenges are, kind of trying out what are the um, issues that we want to include in this goal set, which could be combined, which maybe don't rise to a, a global, um, the, the level of a global um, set in the way that the others do. Um, so it was through those eight sessions that the um, representatives of countries really came to this global understanding um, and found that these um, these objectives really all needed to be together and that if you took out one there would be a big um, piece missing for a significant part of um, of the the global community um, and so that's how we got the the 17 goals um, next slide um, so I know I've gone really fast, um, but I offer um, these two resources for, for further information. Um, we'll have the discussion after this, um, but um, we'll, um, I'll turn it over to Christy now. All right, Christy, over to you. So. Oh, I can unmute myself, but I can't turn my video on. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Maybe you can help me out there. Um, okay, um, thank you so much. I'm so um, I'm so pleased to be able to come and uh, talk about uh, the this thing that's so close and near and dear to my heart is uh, the the B Corp assessment or the um, B Impact assessment and the B Corp certification. Um, it is the uh, it is. Um, the only certification that measures a company's entire social and environmental performance um, across all areas of a business. And maybe we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and actually, in, in this year, something really exciting happened for B Corp. Um, a fast company named B Corp, one of the world's most innovative companies for 2020, uh, which uh, is, is great timing. Um, now, one thing that people <clears throat> tend to misunderstand about the B Corp certification is that it is only for for-profit companies. Um, it is only for for-profits. Um, right now, there's around 3,301 companies certified in 150 industries. 
in 71 countries and they have one unifying goal and that is to use business as a force for good. Um, but you'll see over 100,000 companies and organizations have used the Beat Impact Assessment to measure impact. Um, so that is a free online assessment. Any company, any organization can use it, but only for profits that make a legal change to their articles of incorporation to become stakeholder focused rather than shareholder focused can actually uh, carry that certification. And next slide, please. So within the B Corp certification, within the BIA, um, the, the power of the BIA is that it really unlocks these impact areas. And so, you know, we see companies all the time, um, kind of these marketing messages, we're good, um, good, good food, good brands, all of these things. Um, but really, the only way for us as consumers to understand how good they really are and for the company themselves to understand how good they really are is to do a deep dive assessment on uh, in, in a holistic way. And so the B Corp, the B Impact Assessment uh, measures governance, workers, community, environment, and customers. Um, and within that, we have, you know, one of the, uh, oh, now I can start my video. Thank you. Um, one of the things, you know, that's really timely is equity, diversity, and inclusion. And, and EDI um, underpins the entire assessment. Under, it underpins, really, it's one of those foundational pillars of the assessment. Um, and the, the BIA is really meant to help us. At, it ha we treat it a decade. My company, we treat it as a, as a design tool. Um, so how do we build impact companies? And how do we turn companies that primarily were um, simply bottom line focused into triple bottom line companies? Um, and so what it does is it can help reveal your impact business models. And if we go to the next slide, Yes, so under these key areas, um, for example, under governance, we have, um, it measures mission and engagement, ethics and transparency, governance metrics, and it will reveal whether or not you have a mission locked business model. And that basically means that upon exiting your business, your mission, your social and environmental and economic mission beyond profit is locked in and that can't be, um, uh, you know, you, a company can't just be acquired and then have the mission pulled out of it. Um, and that does require a legal change. And actually in BC, um, we are the first jurisdiction in the Commonwealth to pass benefit company legislation. So very soon this year, I think in the net, within the next month, um, companies, uh, corporations will be able to register as benefit companies. Um, the benefit companies exist in some other jurisdictions. Italy has benefit company legislation. Um, about 38 states in the, in the U.S. have benefit company legislation. Um, but this is new, and B.C., we're the first in the Commonwealth. So that's kind of exciting. So if we go to the next slide, um, workers. So again, in the, in the blue here, these are the things that we measure. We measure financial security, health, wellness, and safety, career development, engagement, and satisfaction. Um, but to go beyond that, we have worker ownership and workforce development. So um, a worker ownership, uh, a great example of a B Corp that just transitioned to a worker-owned model is Bose, um, Bose Brewery. Um, they are a beer company in, uh, in uh, Ontario. Um, and they just adopted that worker cooperative model, as did um, Shandos Construction. They're a B Corp certified company out of Calgary. Um, and they adopted that worker ownership model in order to ensure that they could maintain their, their staffing levels during the downturn. So that really changed their fortunes and ensured that they made it through quite effectively. Um, I guess we have a new downturn now, but previous downturn. Um, the next slide, please. Under community, again, we measure equity, diversity, and inclusion, economic impact, civic engagement and giving, and that civic engagement also includes advocacy. So another one of the powerful things about the BIA is it helps us understand 
how, where all the value exists in our company that doesn't show up on a, on a balance sheet. So in that civic engagement and giving, many companies are philanthropic, um, but they don't communicate the, their philanthropy any, any effectively. They're not communicating the percentage of overall revenue or percentage of profit that was philanthropy. Um, any kind of time that's given um, normally um, is just time that's, that's, it's a sunk cost. It's not something that, that we're tracking and managing um, to communicate on the other end to, uh, to stakeholders, partners, uh, consumers. So under community, we have these producer cooperative local uh, development, that local economic development. Um, a, a really quick example, we, uh, we're currently working with quite a large company in Burnaby and um, previous to us working with them, they didn't know what their economic impact was locally. Um, and now we know that of their, you know, 100 and $150 million a year they spend, 80% of that is being spent within 80 kilometers of their head office, which is pretty amazing um, opportunity for them. They had no idea that wasn't on their radar. And so the BIA makes us address things about our businesses that we hadn't thought of. Um, maybe we go to environment. Yes, thank you. So now, um, with now, it's great that uh, this I come after Lynn, and thank you, Lynn, for all of your guidance and your your knowledge. Um, now the 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 B impact assessment has been aligned. It is newly aligned with the sustainable development goals. And so within the B Corp assessment, there is a new tool called the SDG Action Manager. And so it pulls those 165, 169 indicators, or sorry, 231 indicators and those targets. Um, it helps to try to align those between B Corp and SDGs. And so this is version, we're on version six of the, the B Impact Assessment. And so we'll see, you can see environmental management, air and climate, water and land and life. So they're really trying to integrate these frameworks. Um, but you can see all the various, and this is not an exhaustive list of these impact business models, um, but with clean tech, because I know uh, for Foresight, clean tech is a focus. Um, uh, there's, there's all kinds of opportunities to identify these impact business models for the for those for those companies <clears throat> and then customers is a huge um a huge part of how um we understand impact with with product-based companies and manufacturers um it's uh it's it's easier to understand how to measure that impact um because of how what's what is built into those products, but on service-based organizations, it can be a little more challenging. And so B Corp has set up this beautiful framework to help us understand um, how services um, break down in terms of who are you serving, how are you serving them, and is that is that revenue that's coming into your company, is that impact revenue or is that traditional capitalist revenue? So there really is that distinction there. Um, which I think is really, really powerful for organizations. We worked with um, a company um, in, um, in Richmond, they're a fish company, and you know, they knew they were sustainable, but when we were done our audit with them, um, they knew that 68 cents on every dollar coming into that company had to do with a recognized, trusted, sustainable fishing practice. And so their goals really changed as an organization. Instead of just thinking about, oh, we're sustainable, now they're saying we need to be 32 cents more sustainable on every dollar. How do we do that? And so it really helps with that, that impact management. Um, the BIA is, is the, the tool of choice. And so we, we use it in collaboration um, in tandem with the sustainable development goals. And we treat the sustainable development goals as kind of the mile high um, the river, the big river, and then we treat the BIA as as very much the little the little the little streams coming off that river. Like we understand where we're kind of going, and how do we um, and how do we really design into that? And I feel like I'm talking wonderful. Too much. 
<laughs> no, this is great. I'm casually moving people along. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever you see the slide change. Uh, we yeah. were planning a bit of a breakout, but I think just given the time, we're going to jump right into the third part, which is the new uh, business model canvas plus impact. So I am going to pass it over to Stephen and Frank. Thank you, Jeanette. And um, I'll, I'll kick that off and, um, and Steve and I will interchange uh, amongst each other. Um, and so I'd like, I'd like to give you a bit of background what inspired me uh, over the past few years to identify the situation that uh, we've got some great tech companies and they're actually um, also delivering a great impact, but they're not articulating it, it, it very well. And, and similarly, uh, in spending some time in the uh, impact community, what I found is that some companies have amazing impact, um, but they're, they're leaving kind of like opportunity on the table to uh, engage investors that have uh, uh, more of an economic consideration when they, when they make their investments. And so what I was seeing on the whole is that, you know, both companies are, are missing out, both investors are missing out in, in finding more of the right aligned opportunities for them. And so as a community um, that is delivering um, great innovation, we are all missing out together. And so what I started to think about and, and explore is like, how, how can we connect the dots? And what I was seeing at the larger market, there's a lot of money flowing into the ESG side. And so I thought we've got to bring this to the startup stage, but how can we do that in a very light touch way? And so recently I invited um, um, Christy to, to share some knowledge on, on the B Corp. And that was extremely uh, informative. We did that at the, at the Ventec Angel Network. And so, and now together recently with, uh, with Foresight, um, we found a really great opportunity to drill deeper into this and explore how we can put some tools together in order to help both founders and investors uh, get well more well versed and use that SDG platform as as the common uh, connector and identifier on on how we can do better um, across the business model canvas because that's one of the core models always where we figure out is like okay how do we create a viable business that is uh, that is scalable and that, that that makes business sense. Over to you, Steve. Yeah. So. I'll talk a little bit about the business model canvas. I'm assuming everybody on the call is somewhat familiar with it, uh, but just for, for history lesson, it was uh, formulated by Osterwalder in the mid uh, 2000s. So it's been around for a while and still all the accelerators that we know uh, teach some version of this model uh, as part of their training programs. And we certainly do as well. And what the model is supposed to do is allow you to kind of simplify all the moving pieces of your business. And in simplifying it, it makes it easier to communicate both internally and externally. So that's kind of the, the goal that, that it uh, plays. And so it, it really tries to capture how you're creating value, how you're delivering the value, and then how you're capturing it for your company. So those are the things it's doing. It's simplifying it and letting you look at, at what your business is creating there. So next slide, please. But over the kind of 15 years since it's been around, social attitudes have changed, which I think make it more acceptable to expand what it looks at. So arguably, even at the time of its um, first articulation, it was probably worth looking at, at all of the stakeholders. And, and certainly I remember when I was going through business school, around that time, they were already talking about looking at all the different stakeholders and not just the shareholders. So what is that business model canvas as it currently is, is stated missing? It's missing a clear connection to a broader purpose, the clarity on the impact and that triple bottom line, looking at all the stakeholders involved. And so I think what's missing there is, is it's missing some of the value. It's not capturing the value that's being created for all those stakeholders, right? And if you're not looking at that, and if you're not thinking about that and what's being created, you won't then be thinking about how you can capture some of that, how you can, communicating it internally and externally will actually benefit your business. So with that, I'll turn it over to Frank to kind of talk about some of those benefits that can accrue. Yes, and indeed, as Stephen said, it's 
it's really important for us as founders and investors to take a broader perspective, to think harder about how we can make a difference and, and communicate that better. Um, so here are a few examples on how we can all win with improved clarity on economical, social, and environmental impact via the SDGs. For example, by focus, we'll benefit in the fundraising exercise. We have improved ability to attract more money from aligned investors that value impact. It's also easier to attract and retain aligned, passionate, scarce talent. It's easier to attract more aligned customers that are willing to pay a premium, and companies are more likely to survive and recover faster. Next slide, please. So particularly in the startup world, the team is the one most important uh, part that we invest in. Um, the team has to make everything possible, their vision, their purpose, um, and be able to execute in that. And so where impact also helped, helps the entire team, it's easier to engage talent in solving problems and building the business, particularly when it comes to that alignment in their areas of interest and what they care about. It's easier to rein talent when times are tough and when they are recruited away by others. And the ability to attract scarce technical talent in these days, of course, is a really big one. If you're looking for a great AI ML person and you can find the right person that is very much aligned with your purpose of your business, um, you have a much better chance of getting that person on board in spite of all the other jobs that might be out and open for them. And lastly, of course, at the end of the day, that alignment in purpose uh, and the vision of what impact you can make as a company also helps you reduce the uh, cost of possibly non-aligned bad hires. Next slide, please. So as we said, the business model canvas is a, is a proven tool. It's, it's actively used, but it was developed in 2005 and it misses those considerations of important external factors like environmental social considerations. So we explored ways how to include these considerations across all elements of the business model. Next slide, please. So together as a team and with help with uh, Christy and Stephen, we explored ways on how we could formulate questions for each of the aspects of the business area that would help us uncover how the business could deliver a more balanced uh, impact. And we'd like to take you through some of those examples. The one thing that we added to the business model canvas is purpose. And so we believe that it's extremely important to start with the clarity of purpose and mission of where you wanna go as a founder. Um, getting clear on that is, is the first one most important thing. Now, if we start looking at the post customers, we, we have an opportunity to take a much broader stakeholder perspective on this and ask ourselves, who cares about this problem? Who are the users? Who are the buyers? Who is, who is affected by this problem? And so when we start looking at stakeholders, for example, in, a, um, in an ag business, it's, it's primarily the farmers, first of all, but then it's their employees, it's their consumers of the food that they produce, it's the communities where they grow the food, it's regulators, um, it's taxpayers at the end of the day. Um, and so then we start looking at the value proposition and ask ourselves, how does the solution that you're offering create shared value? It can be in aspects like, you know, healthier soil provides better food, retains better water, retains more water. Um, healthier crops are more, are better able to resist pests and drought. Um, more nutritious foods supports people's health. Um, the preservation of uh, service and ground water quality can be helped by using natural fertilizers rather than chemical pesticides and fertilizers. And there is likely an indirect cost of preventative healthcare if we all start to eat healthier. On the cost structure side, we can ask ourselves, how can impact and circularity become a revenue center? And so when we look at the, the farm industry as a whole, we know it's, it puts a large burden on our environment. And so when we can find out ways to um, create balanced fertilizers from the surplus of manure that we have and 
in turn uh, create a benefit from that that um, requires reduced use of pesticide on our crops. We're winning in a whole number of different areas. Um, we're saving costs um, and we're creating value through the circularity. Um, and so when we look at it, the revenue streams, we can ask ourselves, you know, what social and economical benefits are you considering and are you recording as a business like Christy alluded to? Um, what, what is the value of lo locally transforming and upcycling farm waste and reducing the import of pesticides? So what we would like to do and share with you is this business model canvas. And we really look forward to working with you um, as, uh, as member companies of Foresight to explore some of these areas of opportunity. Next slide, please. Now, I can imagine, and I must admit that, you know, this all is kind of intimidating. There, 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 there is huge complexity here. So what we were looking at is that we want to make sure that companies start thinking about impact, sustainability goals at the appropriate level for the state that they are at. And so um, in the idea stage, it's really like, value comes through the focus on purpose, getting clear on that. Once you start to get into the problem solution stage, you can start looking at, you know, what kind of like functional impact you, you're making. And once you're looking at the product market fit, it starts to make sense to take a more holistic uh, perspective of your entire business model canvas and your communities and stakeholders and supply chain and things of the like. So um, going forward, we look forward to keeping this practical um, as we explore how each and every business can start to take advantage and position themselves stronger in a market and come back better um, after having done some of this work. And I would say that is my last slide. Wonderful, thank you. Stephen, Frank, Lynn, Christy, a lot of information here. I think it's been great to see the progression from these high level global SDGs down to corporate specific activities and how you self assess to become part of the B Corp community. And then furthermore, in the startup community, I mean, this, this impact business model canvas isn't just for clean tech companies. It's for all types of companies. Obviously we're hyper uh, focused on, on clean tech, but the essence of being able to think up front on how you really start to understand. And there's a great comment here about your total ecosystem as customers. And thank you, Trish, for pointing that out. That's exactly it. There's, it's almost like unintentional com um, customers and and stakeholders from from the work we do building businesses and 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 how that trickles in so if you can capture or let's say not capture if you can think about how your work has a positive impact with those stakeholders or vice versa reduces impact that currently exists make that part of your story and ultimately as frank mentioned that's also a great segue into how you can raise capital who you raise capital from um, so with that being said, I'm going to actually pass it over to Julie Angus, who is the CEO of Open Ocean Robotics. Um, Julie, I mean, you know the drill. You've been on lots of panels and webinars. Why don't you just dive in and share sort of your thoughts and experiences? Um, yeah. yeah, great. That would be great. First of all, um, great session. I've really enjoyed it. And thanks so much for having me as, as part of this panel. Um, so a, a little bit of a background on our company. So Open Ocean Robotics produces solar powered autonomous boats for ocean data collection. Um, so one of the big challenges we're facing with our oceans is that 80% of them are unexplored, unmapped, unobserved. Um, and it's because it's really hard. Um, the oceans are huge 
huge, they're very challenging, it's dangerous, it's unsafe. So autonomous technology, marine robotics um, can really overcome a lot of those challenges. So the reason I entered this area is because I'm, I'm passionate about ocean exploration and feel very strongly that um, you know we need to do more to protect our oceans. At the same time, when you're building a, a business, you have to have it be economically viable, you have to have customers. Um, so it's managing that balance between finding a product market fit, a value proposition where you're still creating benefit, a uh, sustainable nature, but yet you're really um, satisfying a need and perhaps allowing industries to operate more sustainably and safely. So um, filling sustainable goals and SDGs in a, in a number of different ways. And I think the business for good is more important now than ever. And we really have the opportunity to emerge from this crisis, this pandemic, with that being at the forefront of our focus. And, you know, we are all very aware of the impacts that um, our world faces from climate change, faces from um, encroachment into wild spaces. You know, right now we're living through a pandemic that is very much a result of, of some of that encroachment. Um, and we're seeing impacts of, um, you know, systemic racism and just really the need um, for, for diversity and for us to embrace this more holistic approach for business. Um, so for, for us, I believe that it's, it's a very, very important guiding force for us to embrace these SDGs and it has positively impacted us in, in a number of ways. Um, one, it guides our mission. Um, whenever we evaluate markets, things that we can do, uh, it's always through that lens of, uh, you know, will this create a, a positive net benefit on the environment? Are we helping industries move towards more sustainably, safer operations, um, those sorts of things. Um, other ways are in wage, ways that um, Frank just recently uh, discussed in terms of in attracting investors. So for example, our first investment came from uh, the Spring Impact Accelerator, Impact Investor Challenge, which was um, all impact companies um, that were vying for a $100,000 seed investment. And Frank was a part of that. And, and we won that competition. It started our pre-seed round and we closed it. Um, we were oversubscribed and it was primarily impact investors. So these people shared our vision of what we want to do and have been extremely supportive not only with their financial contributions but in helping guide our business towards that. Um, two, I would say there's a, there's a fair bit of support from accelerators and programs. So for example, we're a part of Foresight. Um, we've received lots of great guidance and support um, as a result of that. We're also finalists in the Women in Clean Tech Challenge, which was an Impact Canada challenge um, designed to grow more clean tech companies and with that came nearly $800,000 in support and a relationship with Mars Discovery District, uh, an accelerator out of Toronto. Um, we also recently completed Creative Destruction Labs, their ocean stream in, in Halifax. The other thing I would say is uh, attracting staff. It is very competitive, um, especially when you're looking for highly skilled staff in, in AI uh, in robotics and engineering um, and being able to align their interests, their aspirations with what you're doing is very important. Not only are you able to attract that staff, but you have staff that is that much more driven as a result of it. Um, and uh, I think, Customers is also a key um, element. So with our vessels, um, they produce no greenhouse gas emissions. There's no risk of oil spills. They can operate in sensitive habitats where you couldn't perhaps have a diesel fuel. So it opens up uh, a specific market that wouldn't be accessible to companies um, that didn't produce uh, zero emission boats. So and, and there are cus customers as well that are, are looking to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they're looking for different ways to improve their sustainability. Uh, so, so I think some, those are some of the key ways that we've seen uh, focusing on SDGs has helped our company and will continue to help our company moving forward. So thank you for this opportunity to share our goals.
Thanks, Julie. That's great. I'm going to move it around a little bit. Um, Lynn, I'd love to hear from you. You started the conversation and, um, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective on SDG alignment with both the uh, B Corp and BMC um, plus I, as well as maybe some other thoughts you have. Yeah, no, thanks. And I was just thinking that um, part of what I love about the SDGs is that it lets you talk with multiple communities and you have a, sh a shared language to discuss. So as Christy was discussing B Corp, which I've, sorry, I've never heard about, but I'm going to now look, look for it more. She was talking about the importance of governance, workers, community, environment, customers. And I wrote down SDG 16, SDG 8, you know, that these are the SDGs. Um, and these are, um, while you keep all the SDGs or all the challenges in, in mind, these are the ones that are central to what these companies are doing. Um, and just as Julie was talking too, that, um, you know, defining what are those key th um, things and um, the the factors that either you could affect positively or that you might accidentally be affecting negatively and keeping those in mind as you build your business model and, um, you know, move forward with your objective. Um, I saw a ch in the chat the idea of the data being, I think data is underpinning a lot of what Christy is talking about. It's the underlying the SDGs, um, you know, that the, the objective of having these goals and these targets is so that you can measure and you can learn from what you're doing, uh, you know, how you're positively um, impacting your objectives, how you might be having these negative impacts um, and, and then presenting, you know, to the world um, evidence of what you're doing according to the goals that you've proclaimed um, are central to your business model. Yeah, it's very interesting. Christy, I've got a, a question or comment here. Maybe you can chime in. It's regarding um, executive teams and board members. So perhaps governance, perhaps you, maybe you can talk a little bit about governance and, and executive teams as it relates to B Corp mm -hmm. and then trickle, trickle down to impact. Okay, absolutely. Um, so that, you know, for, for a company using the B impact assessment, that governance piece is, is pretty important. Um, and that's going to help. Um, I guess it runs through the entire assessment. Um, one of the big pieces for boards for, like within the BIA is diversity, really trying to see um, um, ethnic diversity, um, gender diversity, and, and uh, diverse mindsets on, on boards of directors. Um, and I do think that the, the, B, the, the, the BIA helps create really truly actionable goals at that governance level. Um, and then, you know, from there we see, you know, um, that ESG goals, one of the, one of the key pieces in that governance section in every assessment. And one of the things I didn't say is that there's actually 90 different assessments within the B Corp tool. And there's a total question set of around 2000 questions and every company will get around 400. Um, the bigger you are, the more you get. Um, and so, but we see one of the common threads through, um, through the BIA is this, this ESG performance evaluations at the, at the uh, executive level and down. Like that, that ESG goals, the company's purpose goals, um, that they are integrated into um, those conversations that are ongoing through, uh, through a company. Um, and I think a really, and they also have a whole other section for companies that have a board of directors because not all companies have a board of directors. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could even get into the BIA and help, help yourself build uh, a diverse board of directors just by using the questions they ask in that assessment as a cue. So <clears throat> I don't know if that was, uh, was, was that what you... <laughs> Oh. No, no, I think that's a great starting point. You know, it's, it, it, I, I think it's a balance, you know, you, you need that leadership at the top to mm -hmm. attract, you know, great people to your teams. And um, sometimes folks need a little bit of guidance on what they need to consider to put their best 
foot forward as as leadership. So I think mm -hmm. I think that's very very helpful. Mm -hmm. Let's pass it over now to to Frank and Stephen. And I mean, I want everyone to keep in mind my style of webinars is come in and we'll chat. So no one's ever prepared <laughs> with questions. So um, I apologize. It's always my style. Um, but um, you know, Stephen and Frank, <laughs> they're used to it a little bit more because they they you know we we connect quite frequently. But um, you know, when we think about the rollout of the new BMCI, maybe Stephen, you can talk a little bit about our about our launch program just quickly, and then Frank, um, maybe you can dive into what we might be looking at to build out that ability to use the BMCI um, a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, certainly in terms of our launch program, which you know, all the company is a long time value and we've had some great feedback on uh, in terms of giving them tools to analyze where their business is and articulate where it needs to go and look at different options. Uh, so the business model canvas is, a, is I think, a foundational element of, of what we teach throughout that course. Um, and again, this isn't reinventing the wheel, it's, it's adding on to and, and there's a number of different approaches and, and different takes on the business model canvas that was originally made. Um, and so there is a, a wealth of supporting material and other things that go along with the business model canvas that we'll still be able to leverage and will make sense in this. And it's just an extension to kind of grasp a little bit more the, the value created for stakeholders and to think a little bit more deeply and prepare to communicate a little bit better the impact. And, and I think as, as Frank sort of said, that's something on the investment, the angel side he was seeing wasn't always really being captured. And I think, you know, on our side in preparing these companies and looking at the reports that they give us on a quarterly basis, we want to make sure that they're, they're telling that story because it's important both for what we do as foresight, but we think it, it'll help them in, in their development, you know, with, with customers, with employees, with investors, if they can really capture that story and, and, build that purpose into the business throughout. Frank? Yeah, well, going forward, I, I mean, having a conversation is nice, but I like doing the work um, with the companies. And so that's the part that really excites me. So what I truly look forward to is um, to work together with the few mentee companies that I have through uh, Foresight uh, to, uh, to apply what we learned here and really um, uh, help them leverage the deeper understanding and the better articulated value proposition in the in raising funding and so what i'm looking forward to um and i know we haven't entirely planned this but it, you know after our launch program there comes an investment readiness program and then we're gonna put companies in front of investors and we're gonna make stuff happen and um um, that said, Ventec is looking, is, you know, has an investor meeting every month. So we are welcoming uh, companies that are investment ready each and every month. And so uh, even from that perspective, I, I really look forward to, to applying uh, some of this uh, insight and making it real in the um, investor presentations um, starting yesterday. So th right. th that's what's on my mind. Yeah, that's great. Um, Krista, we have a quick question here on B impact assessment uh, on supply chain uh, related to the community pillar. So that's quite specific. Yeah. A few uh, quick comments there. Yeah, I, I was uh, I was just spent four hours talking about supply chain and community before I got on this call <laughs> um, with a bunch of companies. Um, so yes, so the the BIA measures the entire value chain of a company um, and what it really looks at in terms of supply chain, it looks for uh, a number of different criteria um, um, beyond just uh, what's in your supply chain, what's national, what's international and unassessed, no third party verification, what's national, uh, what's regional, what's local, and then what's hyper local. And so we go from 80 kilometers to anywhere in the world. Um, and that's all looked at by cost of goods sold. And, um, and so supply chain and value chain are really integrated. Um, basically, it, for the BIA, you need to go through your earnings and your spending with a fine tooth comb and understand, you know, how close is that location to your business? Like how, um, 
are they, uh, are they, um, is their head office within 80 kilometers, if not? So it gets really into the details of where organizations are located, um, whether they're purpose driven, they're a social enterprise, they're a B Corp certified company. Um, um, do they have a diverse, diverse ownership? That's a whole other level of that impact in supply chain. <clears throat> and so basically, in order to understand that, we just have to pull your financials apart and look at every single supplier and every single customer, if we can do that. Great, great. Okay, it is 12.59. Does anyone uh, want to sort of have a, a, a two, 10 second closing statement, Christy? Oh, um, um, well, um, our new normal means we have to save the world. So uh, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's get every company to be, uh, become a B Corp certified company. Let's uh, put like, let me um, work myself out of a job. <laughs> Lynn, any thoughts? Yeah, um, well, I, I mean, I think that the tools mentioned here really help you set up to do do this as correctly as possible the first time. Um, but just so you know, uh, countries are presenting what's called a voluntary national review, which is their assessment of SDG implementation. And they're ending up doing them, um, you know, at two and three year intervals, because it, it is an iterative process that so you do it once and then you learn new things and you, you know, you, you fix them and you get them better and then you do them again and you add the data. Um, but so it, it isn't just a once and done. It's it's a learning process and a um, really seeing how things work as a system and being part of the system uh, for good. Mm -hmm. Great, Julie. From a company perspective, I think that triple bottom line uh, is, is really important, embracing SDGs and uh, just offers a lot of opportunities, not only for company growth, but to for companies to make a difference in, in the world. So um, it's certainly been an extremely great journey for us, and we look forward to seeing it continue once we move out of the startup stage. Frank? Yeah, so... From the investor perspective, I really look forward to seeing um, more impactful uh, considerations that, of the companies that already have great tech uh, going forward. And then the other part that I'd really love to see is kind of like more um, community connectivity. So my area of focus is tech, tech, food tech. I, I think there's a tremendous opportunities for us as, um, as, um, as investors in that sector and as companies in that sector to spend, to get a bit closer together because it, because that is actually the way how we can start filling out and getting more clear on that community and local uh, aspect. And that's, that's another big area to be discovered. Steven? Yeah, so uh, if I had something to say, it would be my colleague, Diane has shared the link there. You can go and download the, the current uh, model, what we showed you there. And we'll also be adding other kind of tools and resources. Some of the questions that go along, I think Frank highlighted in a few of the boxes some of the example questions that you could ask. And we'll be sharing an entire list of that as well as looking for feedback as we go through and work with companies on it to, to make it better and improve it. And so we're, we'll be interested to hear your feedback as well about that. Awesome. Okay, thank you everyone. It's been a great session. I really appreciate all of your time today. Um, really excited that we are incorporating SDGs and B Corp um, thought processes into companies as early as possible. And just a shout out to Stephen and Frank for, for working on the new, uh, the new and improved impact uh, BMC. So thanks everyone. And uh, you'll get a recording sent to you probably in a couple of hours here. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Happy Jeanette.